netradiodogs.com. You got Rick Dollar and Tony Dean, and we're on the phone with a very, very interesting person and uh, somebody I've wanted to talk to for a few weeks now, just since finding out exactly who she was, what she does, and what she has done, uh, and just all falls into place here. Um, Miss Cindy Lovell. And uh, Cindy, you're the curator of the um, Mark Twain Museum in Connecticut. Is that correct? Well, my title is executive director. I'm, I'm not oh. a curator, but but I'm I'm executive director there, and it's the Mark Twain House and Museum uh, that uh, Mark Twain built as a very young man. He wasn't white haired yet. He was a young father and family man when he built this mansion. It's where he raised his children, where he lived the longest. But prior to that, I was the executive director of the Mark Twain Boyhood Home and Museum out in Hannibal, Missouri. So I, I've been uh, working for Sam Clements. His real name, of course, is Sam Clements. I feel like he's my boss, and I've been working <laughs> for him for a number of years now. He's a good boss. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'm sure he doesn't bother you too much. But uh, how how do you uh, how do you take something that you love so much and do it for so long? There's an, Seems to me there would be some type of burnout or something like that involved, but just by the sound of your voice, it does not sound that way. That's for sure. No, it's definitely not. I think some of us are just fortunate we're called to a thing. I think about professional musicians, of course. Uh, Carl Jackson, right. somebody I know we're going to talk about here this evening, and you know, Carl, mm-hmm. for instance, has not had any job in his life except for a musician since since he went professional at the age of 14. Mm-hmm. And and for me, I fell in love with Mark Twain when I was 10, uh, just by, by reading Tom Sawyer. I guess I should say I fell in love with Tom Sawyer. And I read that book again and again, and I did not know anything about Mark Twain or that there were other books. But eventually I, you know, started tripping across them, and um, just he just continued to be my favorite author. And I I became fascinated by him and collected first editions and whatnot, it's kind of funny. I uh, he, wow. you know, he became my hero and Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and these fellows were my heroes. And just like them, I dropped out of school. And <laughs> later, you know, I always wanted to be a teacher. And I eventually became a teacher and a professor. And I used to tell my college students that my PhD stood for post-high school dropout. But it was all <laughs> inspired by Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, I think everybody has read uh, Tom Sawyer one time or another in school. Um, I remember when I was just probably maybe 11, 12 years old. I remember reading the book and just loving it, man. I just love the adventures they would have and, and how uh, yeah. how that story was built. It was so real, you know, for the times. It was just so real to me. Well, it's, it's uh, I'll tell you what, it's about 95% fact and very little fiction. He, well, he oh, changed the amazing. names, and uh, they, that was his childhood growing up there in Hannibal, Missouri, and it's, Hannibal's a place you got to visit. Hartford's a place you got to visit. But uh, I tell people all the time, don't think that because you read Tom Sawyer as a kid, you you know you've gotten full full value out of that book. You need to go back and read it again as an adult. And oh my goodness, I I don't think you'd be able to put it down. You, you'll read it today and, <laughs> and and wish you'd done it sooner. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, Tony, did you ever read Tom Sawyer? Uh, yeah, I read both, but I haven't for a long time. I probably should go back and read it now. Yeah, we may need to crack one open here a little later, uh, you know, because uh, the the dust is on the books, no doubt about it. I mean, there's things we do younger in life that we should continue to do, and of course we don't just because we're human and we have other interests that come along in life. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I think both of those books would be excellent just to sit down and read um, just the heck of it, you know. I visited yeah, the, the Facebook page for the museum, and there, that's a beautiful place. Uh, um, that uh, I I would love to go see that. So that's something we probably should yeah. set up sometime down the road. You're cordially yeah. invited to come up and be my guest, and I'll give you a wonderful behind-the-scenes tour. I'll tell you, the house was named by National Geographic as one of the ten best historic homes in the entire world, and only uh, three homes made that list in the U.S. And it was. Mount Vernon, Monticello, and Mark Twain in Hartford, Connecticut. So it's a beautiful wow. home, and uh, I love it. I, I love taking people through. It's where he wrote those great books. And like I said, he was a young man when he moved there, and um, it's just it's wonderful. When you step inside, you you expect to see the family come stepping right around the corner. We have it restored to look as it did when they lived there, with full of their furnishings oh, wow. and possessions, and it's it's really a magical place. You know, Brad Paisley, who is on the uh, CD 
he was on an earlier project that I did with Carl Jackson um, and recorded a song called Huck Finn Blues. And of course, Brad has a son named Huck. And when right. he came and played, he came and played in Hartford and he came down to see the house and his favorite place in the house is up on the third floor in the billiards room where Mark Twain did his writing. And he loved that little desk tucked in the corner there where, you know, Mark Twain basically finished, finished writing that book, Huckleberry Finn. And, mm-hmm. and I know that's a special place for Brad and, uh, and Lou Harris came through. I gave her a tour of the house. So I invite you to come up and I'll give you the same good behind the scenes tour as they got. <laughs> well, oh, sounds good to me. I've been to the other two. <laughs> I've been to Mount Vernon several times and to Monticello several times. So I guess we have to go to, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's pretty good hard. company to be in, too. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you. So, uh, the CD you were speaking of just a few months ago, of course, was, uh, good old Orthophonic Joy. Uh, that's jumping off the shelves right now, uh, everywhere, uh, that it's being sold. And an interesting fact about you, uh, I hear you do a little writing also. <laughs> you can't help it. If you like to read, I think you also like to write. <laughs> exactly. And I, I like a good story. And uh, like Mark Twain said, if I can't get a, a good story in any other way, sometimes I'm forced to tell them myself. So I, I do that once in a while, too. <laughs> yeah, um, we uh, recently learned that on the Orthophonic Joy album, Mr. Stubbs from the um, Grand Old Opry was the um, the person that read the in between parts uh, between the older songs and the new new recordings that were on the album, and I, I uh, realized that you had written that. Yeah, and yeah. I was amazed, and and that was a fact that I did not know, and um, I thought, man, I really got to talk to her. I got to find out where all this good <laughs> stuff came from because it was uh, it the the way that that the album is presented is probably the the beautiful most beautiful part of of the uh, entire record. I mean, there's great artists. Um, the, the music's wonderful, but the addition of that, uh, you know, spoken voice part between, between the tracks, uh, just makes it sound like an old time radio show to me. Something that I could remember, uh, you know, my grandfather talking about and a lot of people talking about, um, you know, just the way things used to be in, in old time radio, but it just makes it wonderful. Uh, Tony and I were going to the um, Char- going to Charlotte Motor Speedway for the Coca Cola 600 a few weeks ago, and we listened the entire way up and the entire way back. I mean, it was just uh, an album that you can't put down. I mean, once you get started, it's it's there. But uh, how did you? Uh, how did? Yeah, well, yeah, it, it's uh, something that we're we're really uh, proud to be a part of uh, promoting. And um, first of all, I guess the the first question I need to ask you is. Um, how did that all come about, and and why did they come to you, and uh, what exactly made you wanna made you wanna do that? Oh goodness, I I, I guess I'm gonna tell you an efficient version of a long story. At least I'm gonna try to. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> but remember, I do like a good story. But now my I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. My grandfather mm-hmm. was a fiddler. Uh, we did not have TV. We had bluegrass music, and my father and mother only liked bluegrass. Uh, in fact, my dad, we often, often teased him and thought he married our mother to get to our grandfather, who was a wonderful fiddler, had a, <laughs> had a family band. <laughs> so I right. my parents' credit. They had good taste in music, and without having a TV, we just, bluegrass was what we loved. And every weekend, if we weren't at a bluegrass festival, um, we would have fr- friends and family come out, and, and, you know, they stayed there at the house with us at the farm and played music and just loved it. I mean, we just loved it. And in 1968, I was 12 years old, and uh, we went to see Jim and Jesse and the Virginia Boys at a little place called Williamsboro Speedway. And there were, they had a brand new band member, 14 year old banjo player named Carl Jackson. And uh, <laughs> man, he, he took my breath away. Uh, he just, uh, I love banjo music, and uh, he sang, uh, he sang, and he played banjo, and he was just wonderful and a very nice boy. And back in those days, we did not have email or texting, and, and uh, we, we became pen pals, and we literally were pen pals and exchanged letters. And I'd see him on the road at a festival here and there, but we just wrote letters back and forth. And Carl, as you know, went on to become um, quite quite an accomplished musician. He, he already was at the age of 14, but he ultimately went on to become a Grammy Award-winning producer, 
a uh, singer, songwriter, musician can play anything and play it flawlessly. And for my money is just, uh, you know, the best, the best musician alive. He, he is just so um, humble and does not promote himself. And I, I promote him every chance I get because I'm, I'm just so proud of him. But he, he was snatched up by Glenn Campbell. And Glenn was at his zenith of his career. And, and Carl went off to perform with Glenn. And, you know, I, was, I just didn't think much. I just thought, well, that was that. He was off. And, and I kind of, you know, I kept, I didn't keep in touch anymore. I just thought, well, he was gone and moved. And he wouldn't be at that address anymore. So we just stopped corresponding in the year. You know, the years get in the way, but I continued to buy his music and be impressed by his career. And back in 2004, he won a Grammy for Best Country Album that he produced called Live and Love and Lose, and it's a tribute to the Lose and Brothers. So it's one of the most perfect pieces of uh, recording you hear anywhere. I, I, I buy it by the case, and I give them away to friends when I meet somebody who appreciates good music. It's just flawless. Now, I had not talked to Carl in many, many years. But that CD captivated me, and I, I played it all the time, and I uh, loved the, I loved the fact that he had some footage on there of Ira and Charlie Lubin speaking back when they were young, introducing a song, and of course, then the new songs, you know, were done by new artists. Um, right. Allison Krauss and James Taylor won a Grammy for their vocal collaboration on, on "How's the World Treating You," but it was it was a perfect perfect project. I, I just couldn't stop playing it. Well, about the same time. I was playing that nonstop in my car and in my home. I was getting an idea for Mark Twain. Now, at the time, I, I wasn't in Hannibal. I was not yet really working for Mark, for Mark Twain, other than I loved him a lot. And I was teaching school. I was teaching down at Stetson University in Florida, which was my alma mater. And I was, you know, having a you know, good time there. But I was thinking about Hannibal and Mark Twain and thinking about um, doing something to commemorate the 100th year, the 100th anniversary of Mark Twain's death in 2010. And I tracked down Carl's phone number through a mutual friend, called him up out of the blue. I hadn't talked to him since I was maybe 15, 16 years old, something like that. And he remembered me, and I, and I said, great. And I said, would you help me make a Mark Twain CD? He said, sure. And in 2011, we released um, a double CD called Mark Twain Words and Music that tells Mark Twain's life in spoken word and song. And it's a beautiful project. I don't make a dime on it. it the, the proceeds of that CD go to benefit the Mark Twain Boyhood Home and Museum in Hannibal, Missouri. It's a labor of love. Clint Eastwood did the voice of Mark Twain. Jimmy Buffett did the voice of Huckleberry Finn and even put the project on his label, Mailboat Records. Garrison Keillor narrates it. And uh, the singers uh, include, well, I said Brad Paisley earlier. He, he recorded a song called Huck Finn Blues. Um, has Brad, has Emmy Lou. Um, Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver, the Church Sisters, um, Val Stories on it, gosh, uh, Vince Gill, uh, Cheryl Crow, a lot of the same folks that are on this Orthophonic Joy. So we, we did the Twain Project, and we were so proud of it. It's just a labor of love and tells his story. And I hear from somebody pretty much on a weekly basis. I hear from some new person somewhere who says, oh, I just came across your CD. I just love it. It's a great way to learn because it's kind of like this. It's a little balance of story and then a song that helps tell the story. So I have to say Carl and some of his friends wrote some new music for it because we were telling this life of this man and his family and his writing. And so some songs already existed, but some need to be written fresh. And they did that. But then um, I moved out here to Hartford in 2013 to take the job at the, uh, the Mark Twain's Big House out here. And, uh, of course, Carl and I, by reconnecting and making that Twain CD, of course, it was nice to be back in touch with an old friend. And he called me up one day and was telling me about um, Rusty Morrell, get, you know, talk, they were talking. And he had actually been telling Rusty about the Twain Project, and that got Rusty to think in. And one thing led to another there. And uh, Rusty, who was the ex executive producer of Orthophonic Joy, got the idea to, to retell the, the original Bristol Sessions with new music and to use this spoken word concept to sort of set the stage in between each song and be able to talk about the old, uh, the old singers and songwriters and musicians and uh, present that early history. So Carl said, I want you to do it. Will you do it? And I, I was so honored and so floored that he would ask me. And, you know, Eddie, Eddie Stubbs, of course, is he already told me he wanted to get Eddie to record it. And I love Eddie, and I listened to his show on WSM. And, of course, I knew Eddie back when I didn't know him real 
personally, but I knew who Eddie was back when he fiddled for the Johnson Mountain Boys. So uh, to work on a project that I knew Eddie would be recording a spoken word part, I was, you know, really honored. And I spoke with him on the phone at length. He was really kind and helpful and very generous with his knowledge and uh, steered me toward a lot of good books and resources. So I grew up loving that music and, and knowing a lot about it, but not knowing all those little details. And by digging in and researching and um, reading a lot of old newspaper stories and a lot of different books and things, um, you know, I, I put together the narrative that, that Eddie ultimately recorded for this project, and it was a, a tremendous honor for me. Well, amazing. That is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I got to pinch myself every now and then when I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, there's so many things that that have come about that Tony and I have been involved with, um, with this this record so far. That are just fall they fall into place like they're meant to be, and it's um, man, that's the only thing I can say. I mean, you're talking yeah. about pinching yourself. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, it, it really is a great concept, you know, to, to tell that old story and to redo those songs in this way. Right. I, I think that was a brilliant idea that Rusty had. And the city of Bristol, I, I've been down to the museum. I went down all about two months ago. We're actually planning to do some collaborating. Uh, Leah Ross, the director there, and I have talked and mm -hmm. met, and we've got some good ideas, and we're going to do some collaborating. Mark Twain loved Roots Music and, and knew quite a bit about it and performed himself for fun. He played for fun. But um, anyway, we're we're working on brainstorming some stuff that we, we'd like to collaborate and expand our, our um, I don't know, our talents to Bristol and Bristol up here to Hartford. I think I think we're going to do some good work together. It just feels awesome. like a natural fit. But it's a beautiful museum. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it yet or not, but it's, um, it is a fine yeah, we, museum, and I give them a lot of credit. Yeah, believe me. We were, I, I was overwhelmed by all the different things in the in the museum, and there was a uh, made a circle being broken. The, the display upstairs oh, yeah. um, is something that uh, I really, I really hadn't. You know how you feel something when something is just incredible to you. It's just a feeling that mm -hmm. comes over you that you're just you can't get away from. Yeah, I hadn't felt that yet. I, I loved the history and I loved everything about it. And we walked into that display, and I, it it hit me. I was, yeah. I was I was just shocked. It it I mean, does. You're Tony was like, your... "We gotta leave. We gotta leave." I'm like, "No, we don't. No, we don't." <laughs> it no. It, I tell you what. I I spent a day there, and it was too short. And I can't wait to go back and spend more time there. And I want to take my all my family there. I have family all over the country, but I'll be making a lot of trips in there with friends and family. I, I give them a lot of credit. They really. It's a, it's not only beautifully presented, but just quality artifacts and photos yes. but it's an acoustic museum it, it houses the sound and it does it beautifully i mean when you go in that auditorium and look at that floor now my dad mm -hmm. taught me to appreciate wood we had a, a sawmill on the farm and, and you appreciate good wood well uh, i lose here i believe somebody from around in the region down there now i forget exactly but one of the uh, guitar makers in the, in the region donated the shorter pieces of wood that he couldn't use to build guitars and that's the flooring in the auditorium. I mean, you know, it's, right. that's, it's just powerful to walk into that. And, and the sound, the acoustics, they use an acoustic engineer. And, you, you know, you just, you got to appreciate the sound when you go in there. If you went in there and couldn't see a thing, you are going to have one heck of an experience. They really exactly. did a brilliant job. It's state of the art. You're carried back yes. in time and you go back in time with the music but it's state-of-the-art delivery, and yet you feel like you're at home. It's got a great old home feeling. You feel like you're on the front porch. You feel like you're going to open up the screen door and invite somebody to come in and sit down with you. They really knew what they were doing when they built that museum. Oh, yes. I mean, we completely agree. It's It was a, a, a kind of a, a, a groundbreaking thing when uh, somebody decided to take – the birthplace of country music museum and, and find a real home for it. And it, you know, had two or three locations here in town, uh, before they, uh, finally, you know, settled where they are now. And that was probably the, the best location they could have ever found. 
Uh, a lot of those perfect. older older buildings in downtown have uh, very thick walls, and they're made very well. Uh, so yeah. they, you know, they had to go in and do some things, but they didn't have to do a whole lot structurally. Uh, now, and what, the what place they did, is rock solid. It is, and it's beautiful. And they they mixed all the right elements in there, and the acoustics are fantastic. And you know, and they I are. should add that the Orthophonic Joy CD, the, the 1927 Bristol Sessions Revisited, that project, it's a double CD with spoken word mm-hmm. and song, as, as we were saying, just like the Mark Twain CD. And this CD is a benefit for the birthplace of Country Music Museum. So when people buy it, they're not mm-hmm. only getting a, a lot of good music and and getting background story and information, but they're, you know, in a way, it's allowing them to make a contribution back to support that museum. And I, I'll tell you, when I was growing up, I didn't realize, I didn't know a thing about museums and how they needed money and relied on donations and things. I truly didn't. When my parents had a little extra money to give, they tended to send it off to missionaries, give it to church, things like that. And I did not realize that, you know, places like a museum needed some money until I moved to Hannibal, Missouri in 2007. And, uh, uh, became a board member at the Boyhood Home. I volunteered and was a board wow. member before I ever went to work there. I was I, I, when I went up there. I actually went up there and got a job at a university just so I could volunteer at that museum. I look back and <laughs> say that out loud. It's funny because I literally That's one way to get in the door, though. <laughs> well, you know, but I wasn't trying to. I, I I had a tenured position at my alma mater in Florida, Stetson University, is where I got my bachelor's and my master's degree. There, there, there I was at a tenured. You know, professor teaching school, teaching in the education department, having a great time. But I had been to Hannibal a few times, and I really did love it up there. And and I and and what happened was I had volunteered in the summer of 2006 and taught a teacher workshop. And somebody there at the museum, I don't remember anymore who said it, but somebody said, "Gosh, if only you lived here, you could really help us out." And then I just felt that I should go. It felt it felt important to me yeah. to go up there, and I. Originally, I thought that'd be where I retire someday, but I went up and volunteered, joined the board, and that's when I realized uh, that Mark Twain CD that I had on my back burner that I was working on with Carl needed to become a benefit for that museum, and it has been, and it's done a good thing for the museum, but now this orthophonic joy, this beautiful project that Carl Jackson has produced is a benefit for the birthplace of Country Music Museum, and I'm really, really proud. <laughs> like I said before, I'm just so proud I got to research it, and I only wish my dad was still alive and and uh, my my grandparents because that that was, I mean, my dad and my grandfather would of course play these tunes into the wee hours, and they'd talk about A. P. Carter as though he was an old family member. What A. P. This and A. P. That, and you know, I grew up with those names and their music all around. And when we would go anywhere, you know, like I said, I grew up in southern Pennsylvania, but when we would get on the road to go someplace down south, my dad loved to drive on a Friday night because the signal coming in from WSM was powerful, you know, it's a powerful wow. signal. And you could go down through Virginia and you could pick that up. And he loved um, driving down there late at night. We'd listen to the operator the whole way down, always hoping, of course, that Bill Monroe would be on. And, and if it was December, we would always be hoping that he'd be playing Christmas Times to Come, and I just remember that vividly. Mm-hmm, yeah, and uh, So to be able to help tell this story and share this story with others um, really was uh, just one of the greatest honors I've ever had in my life. Cool. My favorite Incredible. My favorite story on there was uh, talking about the Carters and the flat tires. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. Story. <laughs> yeah. You know what's yeah. funny? Carl, Carl actually, um, you know, they – he had he had most of the songs picked out that he wanted to do, and of course some of the singers picked out different songs. Like you know, Dolly really wanted to ring, uh, sing when they ring those golden bells. But uh, so Carl gave me a lot of the songs and said, "Here are the songs," and he still had a couple others. And and I researched and wrote for some of the other songs. And one of my favorites did not get used, and that was "Single Girl, Married Girl." And I wrote a piece for that that I really enjoyed researching and writing. But uh, that one didn't get used, and. And I remember one night he called me up and said, okay, to the work. <laughs> I need you to get to the work. <laughs> and I, I literally, <laughs> I had been researching. I had a lot of uh, a lot of notes about a lot of songs that I never did write the full up, you know, the full story for them, but I had all the notes. And uh, Kedma was coming down to record. So and right. Eddie was coming in the next day to, to do some more narration. So that was fun. I was real excited about Kedmo coming in because I loved his music. And that one just sort of almost wrote itself. That was a really fun one to write. And uh, 
And I did get to get out of the studio, and Eddie recorded the bulk of his. That was a big honor. I was there with um, Steve Canyon Rangers. Edie Burkell was in there that day. Um, she wasn't on this CD, but she was in there and did a recorded the song with them. That was a lot of fun to listen to. And I got to put on the headsets myself at the end of the day, about 1130, 12 o'clock that night. I uh, put the headphones on and went into the studio, and I got to sing the, the chorus of Shall We Gather at the River along with, you know, all the whole orthophonic choir that Carl Paul did. You know, <laughs> what a yeah. great idea that he had everybody on that project. At some point, everybody sang the chorus of that song so that at the very end of the CD, you hear everybody. But when you, you as you know, when you hear it, one, one of the, the prettiest parts about it is you can hear Dolly Parton sing that beautiful high tenor part, and it's just her her harmony so pretty. And now I get to tell everybody that I recorded a song with Dolly Parton, and I'm I'm only slightly stretching <laughs> when I say that. <laughs> hey, we got to try to work that out, Tony. I, I want to do a song with Dolly Parton. Right, right. You know, I don't know if they'd let me or not, but hey. That was a heck, of a, 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 heck of a touch, a I, heck of yeah. an artistic touch right there. Yeah, really. I I don't know about you guys, but I have not been able to pick out a favorite song. And, of course, some of the stories are just so extra special. And uh, right. I love uh, Train on the Island and Jimmy Edmonds, and uh, and that story was just so special to me. And I love that song. In fact, I play that song, and I play it in the car a lot when I'm doing a road trip. And that woo-woo of the train whistle that they sing <laughs> just sounds like a train and I have heard that song no less than a hundred times. I guarantee you probably no less than 200 times, but I always jump and think, what is that? <laughs> I jump when I'm driving. That's a pretty song. <laughs> pretty Polly that Carl recorded is, is um, good. It just takes me back to my childhood and I, I, I just can't take a favorite. They're all so darn good. I, um, I love them. And I love the stories. I love reading about them and writing about the people and, and the songwriters, you know, they get lost in shuffle sometimes. And I have a tremendous respect for songwriters. You know, Carl himself is a really talented songwriter. We discovered by accident in the studio one day working on the Twain Project. Um, he wrote, I never knew, it didn't occur to me that they ever looked to see who wrote it, but he actually wrote what was my dad's favorite song and the very song that we played at my dad's funeral. And I still oh can't God. get over that. What a miracle that that. I, I yeah, never really. get over that. But um, but yeah, it was just to research all those people and and be able to help tell their story a little bit. I I'm very proud and hope hope people enjoy it. And I think Eddie did a fantastic job with reading. He he knows those stories, so it sounded very authentic as he uh, as he read and told those stories on the on the CD project. Hmm. We were taken by a particular song uh, by Corbin Hazlett, uh, "Darling Cora," and uh, yeah. yeah. That that one just gives me chills, man. We were yeah, driving that's to, good. to Charlotte, and that thing just ate me alive. I looked at Tony and I said, "We have to talk to this guy. Right. We, yeah. uh, we have to talk to this guy." I just, uh, I just felt it so strongly. And uh, luckily, uh, you know, the seventh of June, we we got to uh, visit him at his home, and uh, we spent most of the afternoon with him, um, doing a, a very in depth interview of you know, the person that he really is. And I think, you know, sometimes people want to know that about people that are musicians or whatever. They just want, uh, you know, they want to know who the real person is, you know, what they like, what they don't like, things like that. And Corbin was one of the, um, I'll say he's one of the most humble people that I have ever met, but I have a deep, deep, um, I I guess you'd have to say a respect for him, for the person that I know. He's, uh, He reminds me of so many people that say my grandfather knew, uh, and I told him this. And I think he uh, he kind of gets upset with me sometimes. I call him old old man when I call him. <laughs> I say, "What's going on, old man?" And he asked me one day. He said, "Why do you call me old man?" I said, uh, "Well, because you're an old soul. You got mm-hmm. somebody old in there somewhere. I don't know where they're at or who they are, but." You make him keep playing the banjo. <laughs> yeah, well, you know when when he won when he won that contest. You know that's one of the things I loved about Orthopodic Joy is that yeah. in the spirit of the Bristol session, they did a talent search, and he won that talent search. So I I called him and we spoke at length by phone. So I interviewed him so that I could be able to write the intro for his song and be able to say something about him. And he was just as sweet and charming and lovely as a person ever could be so polite, so respectful, and so knowledgeable about the history, the music, 
And for just a 20-year-old fella, I mean, he really, Mm -hmm. you're right, there's an old soul in there. And you can hear it in his voice and in his banjo. He he is. And I I enjoyed that interview. I saw that interview you did with him, and I just kind of enjoyed that very much. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. I appreciate that. well, yeah, and, and he is he is just a fantastic fellow, and I, I'm really proud to say they included that element of, of that talent search in, into it. And then, you know, that he put together, uh, Carl put together a little group of shotgun rubies. Now, some of these, you know, when you hear these, these songs, you think, these people should be household names. The shotgun rubies, of course, that's Val. Oh, yeah. Lori, Del Nora Reed and Danny Flowers, and they sing I Am Resolved, and that's another one of those songs. I put that on repeat and just can't get enough of it. Their voices <laughs> are just so pure and so perfect and just just fantastic. I, I, oh, yeah. I Like I said, you can pick, close your eyes and point at that CD and play any song, and you're going to love it. There's not one song on there I don't love. Um, I... I, I uh, every day I could tell you a new favorite, but it won't last. The next day I have a different favorite. <laughs> that's, uh, that's sort of the way we feel about things, too. Now, I guess we could tell everybody the uh, we're going to be making a visit to uh, to Carl uh, in Nashville on the 29th and the 30th of June. Um, going to be going down and uh, checking out the show that he does every Monday night uh, at the Station, Station Inn. Inn. Yeah. I've been there. And... Uh, he has uh, very. He just w- wants us to be there. Wants to see what's going on and everything. We are going to be graced with a uh, a one-on-one interview with Carl, uh, and uh, hopefully with a lot of the people that are going to be there that evening. But a lot of the people that you've named already are going to be there, and uh, I'm not going to tie them all down because <laughs> who knows something could happen. But uh, Net Radio Dogs is trying to go the extra mile to give uh, all the all the promotion that we possibly can for this record. It's just uh, hit home on a couple of different fronts with Tony and I both. And we feel like this is going to be a project that's going to be lasting for a long time. And we need to make sure that it does um, as much as we possibly can. But uh, I'm so glad that you're um, the role that you had in, in the making of the album um, it is, it's such a large role. I had no idea how far back, you know, how in depth you went into this, uh, you know, being friends with Carl for so long and, and things like that. I guess the only, the only, the only time you find out things like that is, is, is when you sit down and talk to somebody. And uh, yeah. I think everybody, all of our listeners are going to be, going to be thinking about this now. It's all, this whole uh, thing is just putting one big, huge, beautiful puzzle. And uh, it's, uh, you find a new piece every day and exactly where it fits. And that's, yes, that's, what makes, that's what makes us happy, you know? Yeah, but, it, um, it all has been that way. And when you just look at the singers that are on this. Now, that speaks to who Carl is. For Carl to be able to call these people up and for them to say, absolutely, it tells you how much they respect Carl. It also tells you how much they love this old music. And they want to honor that, and they want to honor those people. These are poor people. My grandparents were poor people. But when you're playing and singing that music, you are rich beyond measure. And That's I'll right. tell you what. Growing up with that, that that just the music just uplifts you like nothing else can. And some of these people, of course, made it very big, and but they've never forgotten their humble beginnings, and they've never forgotten people like the Carter family who had all those flat tires going and the girls dressed in calico. And you know, Ralph Pierre was a little surprised with the way these people dressed coming in that studio, but but he was a smart man and he heard their voices and their songs, and thank right. goodness you know, preserved them, recorded them. And, you know, here we are today, you know, still, still taking so much joy from that music. You couldn't get a better title for a CD than this or the fun of joy. No. Joy is the did you, right word. Did you happen, did you happen to come up with that? No, orthophonic joy is because in 1925, Vic, uh, right. uh, Victrola, Victor company came out with these, that uh, new Victrola, the orthophonic Victrola and mm-hmm. their advertisement, said, don't deny yourself the sheer joy of orthophonic music. And Carl just loved that ad. He loved it. And he said, I'm thinking it should be called orthophonic joy. And I said, I can't even imagine anything better. But the word joy, when I hear this CD, when I hear this kind of music, that's what I feel. I feel joy. And to have that beautiful name out there, orthophonic, I mean, you feel like you're traveling in time when you hear it. But it's <laughs> it's beautiful, and and of course they used all this great new technology. And at the time, it was really the technology 
that made Piers' recording so good and allowed him to take them out to the world in, in masses like they were because that Victrola right. was selling so well that everybody, you know, everybody who could get one got one. And if you couldn't afford one, you'd go over to your neighbors and sit and listen to theirs. So, exactly. you, know, people, you know, people needed records. They needed those new records. And, um, you know, I think it's easy today. We mass produce everything. We download and I think it's easy to, to forget, you know, the labor that goes into this. And, you know, I've watched right. Carl work in the studio, and, and it doesn't uh, happen overnight or by accident or by luck. It is hard work in the studio. And uh, one of the things I learned from making Mark Twain Words music CD was that when Carl Jackson is producing an album, uh, the studio gets the nickname of Carl Jackson's Torture Chamber. Now, I have heard her. <laughs> We're glad to bring that up when we talk to Carl. You, you've got to ask him about the torture chamber, because the first time I heard that I, was the church sisters who'd been interviewed, and I heard them say that, and I just tickled, I was tickled me to death, and I laughed, and I laughed. So I was like, came to learn later, the person who actually came up with that nickname was none other than Jesse McReynolds, Carl's first boss. And, you know, Carl, and to, to have the tables turned, Jesse and Jim and Jesse used to be his boss, and there he is in the studio with Jesse producing, and but but he is a perfectionist, and I mean that in the best way. Yeah. I, I, there's not when it comes to music, boy, you want somebody who's a perfectionist. And I, you know, I watched him uh, when Brad Paisley was in the studio. I watched him, uh, you know, with other people in the studio. It doesn't matter who is in their recording. He's a perfectionist, always with a smile on his face, always getting your best out of you. And even the night that I recorded, I record, I sing with my family. You know, I'm not a I'm not a studio singer. I'm not a, 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 a professional <laughs> singer, but I wanted to be part of that orthophonic choir. And he asked me to be, and he said, everybody in this project is going to be on this choir singing. You've got to be on it. And I, I didn't hesitate because oh. I knew it was just us. And I, and I, and the engineer was there and I walked in that studio to sing. And I thought, you know, I'm singing and that's my friend. And he's not going to let me go. He's not going to let me go home till it's right. And he was so precious. I've got to tell you, I sang that chorus. And he said, that was great. He said, that was great. Gave me a big compliment, made me feel good. He said, now let's just go back. And he rewound it back. Let's just grab let's just grab this piece right here, and let's do that piece again. Well, to be honest, if there was a camera in there, I, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we didn't record every single line several times. <laughs> so he got everything the way he wanted it. But uh, it, it wasn't a torture chamber, but it was, gosh, I didn't even know that was on my bucket list, but now I can say I've had Carl Jackson <laughs> record me singing in the studio, so I suppose that's a pretty good thing to say. Yeah, you've done it now, no doubt about yep. it. <laughs> Tony, Tony has a pretty big family that uh, um, actually has married into family. They've got a lot of musicians in their family also, and uh, we've he never grew up a- sort of like sort of like we did, you know. Yeah. We never yeah. had a family reunion or a picnic or something that people weren't playing music. And I guess there's a lot of families that don't have that. And uh, they're, they're the people yeah. that are seeking this. I, I feel bad for people who didn't grow up with a, like we I feel so lucky. I Now that I'm older and I can look back and I get it. Back then I enjoyed it. Back then I loved it. But honestly, I sometimes think about how other people grew up. And I think how I grew up and I had this music was always a part of my life from the day I was born. Boy, I feel lucky. I feel so blessed that I grew up in a family that valued this music. And I, I mean, my dad, I'll tell you, we, 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 every new album that came out, it was purchased. It was brought home no matter how hard times were. We got a hold of those albums. And I learned to listen to, to albums with my dad. We, you know, we're six kids in our family, but we all would do this. But I remember sitting there with him listening to a new record and you wouldn't talk, you wouldn't breathe, you're almost holding your breath because you didn't want to miss a note. And all of a sudden, now, what it was, but every now and then, like, fiddle, like, you know, just a beautiful piece would come on, and we would just elbow each other, like, get that, get that, you hear that? And we'd hit each other with our elbows. I mean, I remember <laughs> doing that as a kid. <laughs> and to this day, I, I, you just want to share it. You want you want to look at somebody and nod your head and smile and say, do you hear that? Do you hear that? And that's yeah. how I feel with orthophonic joy. That's how I feel with Mark Twain words and music. That's how I feel with... Uh, Live and Love and Lose and the, the songs of the Lose and Brothers. Carl, those three albums are never away from me. They are in my car all the time and they are in my home all the time. And I listen to them all the time because they're that perfect. And that's a rare thing to have, you know, one person make that much perfect music. I mean, 
I, I love all blue uh, jazz. I, there's really nobody I don't like, but uh, Carl is one heck of a producer, and I don't have to say that. I mean, his work speaks for itself. Right. He, people love his it. It really does. It really does. We were, uh, you know, I've, I've had the honor of talking to Carl on the phone a couple of times, and he's, uh, um, I, I, the first time I talked to him, I, I remember it was kind of a shock because I didn't really know whose number it was. And it came up on my phone, and I'm like, who is that? And you was, and you got him on the phone, right? And I said, uh, I said, hello? And he said, Rick? I said, yes? And I thought, who is this calling me? Uh-huh. <laughs> and he said, Carl, Carl Jackson. And I said, hey, Carl. <laughs> you know, and then it was like, from that point on, it was like talking to, you know, your grandfather or your uncle or somebody in your family. Oh, an old friend, yeah. We, yeah he's we got he's along like... We got along so well, and, and he is a true, true friend of the show, uh, such as everybody else that's ever been on here. And he is uh, somebody that's looking to, to help radio, uh, Net Radio Dogs do something different, um, you know, where he's at. So he, he's he, a uh, great contributor to what we're what, what our focus is right now. He sure is. Well, I'm going to tell you, he's got a, a huge heart. He's the most big-hearted, generous person. I'm going to tell you a funny story. It goes with what you just said. Back when I got <laughs> this notion that I had to make this Mark Clean CD. Now, originally, you know, I didn't know what I wanted. I just I couldn't stop listening to that Lubin project. And when I and I, I didn't even know at first that it was Carl. I was just listening to it and just loving it. And then I started reading all the fine print. I'm like, good Lord, Carl Jackson produced this. What is this? He's become he's a genius. I knew he was talented, but he's become a genius. Well, yeah, many he time, is. he is a genius. And there I was. I was teaching at Stetson University and just having a great time there. It was you know, like I said, my alma mater, and I am teaching and enjoying life and. One of my um, jobs there, uh, I was the chair of the Artist and Lectures Committee, and that meant that I got to help book, uh, you know, speakers, authors, whatever, to come there to Stetson and, and, and entertain or speak or enlighten people. Well, I got it in my head. It was right after, oh, brother, where art thou? Now, when I was a mm-hmm. kid, I knew Ralph Stanley and everybody. I heck, the whole band came up and spent the night at my home one time with back when with Keith Gaggs and Keith Whitley were just boys in the band. They came up and spent the night. Curly Ray Klein, and wow. Roy Lee Centers, Jack Cook, they were all there and, and stayed the night at my house one night. But, um, uh, you know, I I thought, you know what, I'm going to book Ralph Stanley. He, you know, he he really had caught on after, oh, brother, where art thou? And I thought the college would be would really be happy to have him and you know it was fantastic ralph came oh, yeah. big show put on a great show and i'd seen him perform hundreds of times but you know to have him come there to my college and play i was so proud so i you know i had just had ralph there and that was wonderful and then i got this idea about you know tracking down how do i track down carl jackson because i'm thinking he's a big superstar he's not going to remember me how in the world am i going to find him and will he talk to me? So I called I called Ralph's agent, and to be honest, I sort of, you know, they knew I just booked Ralph there, and, and Ralph got paid. They didn't know really. I just said, look, I'm trying to get a hold of Carl Jackson. Can you help me? And they said, hang on a minute, and they gave me a phone number. Now, I got to tell you, when I dialed that number, I thought I was going to get a great big front office and go through 18 secretaries and assistants and have to be vetted. And of the nicest fellow in the world answered that call himself, and yep. and I couldn't believe it. And I said, "Oh my goodness, I I didn't think you'd answer the phone yourself." And I told him who I was, and said, "I don't know if you remember me." He said, "Of course I remember you." And uh, and I was just so relieved. I said, "Well," and I and I just jumped right into my Mark Twain idea, and I said, "I had this idea for Mark Twain." He said, "I think it's a great idea. Let's stay in touch. Let's make it happen." And I'll tell you what, little Hannibal, Missouri, that Mark Twain boy at home. They are very grateful that Carl Jackson is the kind of guy he is because he put oh, yeah. his 100% heart and soul into that project. It's flawless. It's perfect. It's uplifting. I never get tired of hearing it. I play it all the time. And he's just so generous. And I've seen him with young musicians and, and give his time and give his uh, his uh, his advice. And he's so kind. And even in the studio, when we were making Twain, he said, now, Cindy, he said, I'm going to I'm gonna bring the right people to this project, he said. And I know some, some famous people. Well, he didn't have to tell me that. I sure knew that he knew a lot of famous people. But he said, what I'm going to do 
He said, when I hear a song, then I know what, what singer should be singing. I can hear it in my head, and I know what singer I want to sing that song. He said, not everybody's going to be somebody famous that you've heard of, but I promise you this, it's going to be the right song and the right singer for, the, for that song. And you exactly. go, and if you haven't heard the Mark Twain Project yet, go listen to a song called A Cowboy in His Soul that's sung by Bradley Walker. And then uh-huh. you'll see what I'm talking about. Or listen to Love is on Our Side by Val Story. Val Story and Bradley Walker should be household names, but they're not. But a guy like Carl Jackson, who is, is a powerful guy, if you think about it, and he can pick up the phone and call Emmy Lou Harris. He can call Vince Gill. He can call Brad Casey. And they want to come and be on a project with him. But he also calls people who aren't household names because they are great talents and he's a generous person. And I, I right. the world, a world of respect for Carl. And I've gotten to know his dad, Lethal Jackson, and his dad is one of the finest people. After getting to know Lethal, I can see why Carl's such a nice fellow because Carl had a really good upbringing. You know, I know his sister, and I only wish I had known his mother. But every Christmas, every December, I go down. And I almost said home. I go home. I go. I go down to Louisville, Mississippi, to Carl's hometown. Every Christmas, they do two concerts back to back down there to raise money for the, the the theater restoration that they're doing there in that town. Carl brings in all these wonderful friends and they perform and I haven't missed it. I started going back well back when we reconnected and I haven't missed one and I never will. As long as my health is wow. good, I'm I'm gonna be there and uh it's um it's something good that he does for his community. So I guess if I don't say anything else I have to say what a what a great person Paul Jackson is just as a human being. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd spoken with him for about three minutes, and uh, just the words that he spoke to me, he knew exactly what I needed. He knew what I wanted to do, and he, um, I said, I have to stop you right there, uh, Carl, and he said, okay. I said, everything that I've ever been told about you has just shown itself in the last three minutes, mm-hmm. and I think you're one of the, be- one of the best, best guys that could, I could be on the phone with right now. Yeah. And it it was a, a pause, and me not knowing Carl Jackson, the uh, you know the person, he uh, he said, "I really appreciate what you just said. That means a whole lot to me." And I knew that he was for real. You know that when yeah. he tells you something, it's right down the line. You do not have to, uh, you know, guess what he meant by something. And yeah. um, just a short time period that I've known him. I mean, it's. Um, I'm sure in the future we're going to be uh, doing some stuff with Carl again, just because we are. Uh, if it's if there's any any uh, chance at all, uh, we will. Just simple fact. It's a uh, he's just a good guy, and I know you hear people yeah. say that, but it's you can hear it in his voice and the way he talks to you. Um, like you said, he always tries to bring the best out in everybody, not just musicians, yeah. but but people that he knows. Um, but uh, he's a great guy, and we're really looking forward to going down and, and spending some time with him and uh, learning about uh, some of the other musicians on the record. Um, I think Shotgun Rubies are going to be there. Uh, Good. can't remember exactly. He told me there's going to be like seven or eight, and he said, uh, you know what? You don't want to just talk to Carl Jackson. You need to talk to these people too. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I'm thinking that's probably going to be a pretty late night at night. You'll have so, a ball. He, they're all oh, yeah. all of the earth, the nicest people in the world, and oh my goodness, such talent. There's I don't know any better way to spend a Monday evening than to be at in the station and when Carl and right. are in there. It's uh, it's historical. I've been in there with a lot of friends, and uh, I'm always itching to go back, always looking for a reason to get myself down to Nashville and go hear them play. And they they take exactly. quests. They play it all night and. It's a, it's a music it's a place for music lovers. It's not some noisy rowdy place. It's right. people go there and respect the music. It reminds me of the old Birchmere uh, I used to go listen to down in Alexandria, Virginia, and you respected the music. You weren't there to chatter and make noise. You were there to listen to the music. But yet you're you know you feel very intimate in there, sitting around the tables and all. And oh, it's it's wonderful. Gosh, I might have to find out when you're. When you're going, I might just have to zip on down there from Monday night. <laughs> yeah, come on down. Sounds good. I'm sure it'll be a good time. <laughs> it's a great place. <laughs> now Tony actually uh, uh, is a, is a little bit of a musician too. He plays the um, plays the mandolin and uh, ah. plays a little guitar, I think. And uh, 
So we may uh, we may lose Tony when we go down there. He pulls out the mandolin. So. Well, Carl, Carl has Carl a made us put well him in the studio. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, and he's well known to pull people up on that stage when they're there. When when we launched the Mark Twain uh, Words of Music, well, we did it two ways. We we kind of uh, celebrated that we that we put it together. Uh, so we had an event at the Boyhood Home there in Hannibal and performed. And Carl brought some folks there and performed. Our story came up and. Uh, Rusty Young was in the audience. Rusty and Mary Young, and you know Rusty Young from Poco, right. the band Poco, mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. came up for the uh, for this uh, big celebration that we were having. And there's a song on there. Uh, Marty Raven recorded it for the project, and Carl was performing it. It's called Indian Crow, and they wrote it just for the Twain project because it was to go with this, that particular story segment when Mark Twain was in India. Well, right. Carl, he just he knows he knows who he knows who's got talent, who who can do what, and he knew Rusty was there, and they're old friends. And Carl knew. I mean, when you hear Indian Crow, you'll know why he did it. He said, "Now this next song, you know, Indian Crow," and he said, "Rusty," he said, "I know you've got to have your your Dober out there in the car, go get it." And Rusty <laughs> came up there and played it, and he'd never heard that song before. He'd never played that song before, but it mattered not. He is a total professional as well. And, Rusty Young sat there and accompanied Carl Jackson on Indian Crow at the Mark Twain wow. Boyhood Home, and it was historic. I gotta say, it was it was fantastic. I can imagine. I can imagine. Yep. He'll so, call yeah, you I up. could yeah. lose. Uh, I could lose. Yeah, I could lose Tony when I go to. Cindy, I may have to get you to be my co-host for a while. I play, I play a mean. <laughs> well, listen, listen, Rick. You just learned I've got. No, I'm not shy when it comes to talking. <laughs> that, that's a good thing, you know. Neither one of us are either. I mean, I got in trouble. I don't know how many times in school for telling me, please don't talk. But you know, the whole time they're trying to teach me to communicate, and, and I just that's never, right. you know. You know, I don't understand. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, it's been a wonderful evening with you, and uh, we you. appreciate your time. And uh, uh, Net Radio Dogs is, is trying to bring everybody that we can from the Orthophonic Joy album to our listeners. Um, it's all, a, like I said, it's all a big puzzle, and, and we're finding all the pieces, and they're all fitting together. So, uh, for Tony Dean, it's Rick Dollar at NetRadioDogs.com. We've been talking with Miss Cindy Lovell, and uh, everybody, go see this uh, this museum, the the Boyhood Home of Mark Twain. Uh, kind of give them an idea of how to get there, Cindy. If they say if they're driving up the interstate and they need to, they want to pull off and, and come see what you guys offer. Well, if they come, the Boyhood Home is out in Hannibal, Missouri, so that's easy. Right. It's just a hundred miles mm-hmm. north of St. Louis. You just walk Highway 61, and, and you're there uh, to come okay. out to where I am now. So. Mark Twain uh, home in Hartford, Connecticut, that's another easy one. We're really right at the intersection of Interstate 84 and Interstate 91 right there in Hartford, Connecticut. And I will tell wow. you, when Mark Twain built that house, there weren't any interstates there. He, it was on. It was a little place called Nook Farm. It was out in the country. <laughs> it's not, it, When you come there, you, you still feel like you're out in the country because luckily we're surrounded by all the trees and the birds are singing. It's beautiful. But it's just literally right off the interstate of 84 or Interstate 91. It puts you right there at the Mark Twain House Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. So if you want to come up and see the house where he raised his family, that's where you'll find me now. And I welcome you to look me up and say hello. But to all your listeners, I, I, I would love to welcome them. You tell me you tell me you heard it on this show, and I'm not going to make you buy a ticket. I'm going to take you in the house myself. So well, well, come cool. on up. And, <laughs> you sure you we appreciate that. <laughs> I want to thank her for uh, preserving history and sharing yeah. Mark Twain with the world and uh, helping spread the sheer joy of orthophonic music. Aw, yes. thank you. Aw, I'm so, well, Yeah, because like I was saying, you know, what I was saying earlier, man, she's a big piece of this puzzle, right. you know. Uh, I didn't realize how big of a piece until we, we did this interview, but uh, if there was no Cindy Lovell, there would have been a lot less on this record that people want to listen to. That's for sure. Thank you. So, uh, the no problem at all. We uh, enjoyed talking to you. And uh, for Tony Dean, it's uh, Rick Dollar and Cindy Lovell. We're Net Radio Dogs, and we're out of here.